welcome back class two so we're going to jump over into i want to show you a couple more things Alright, so here we are. We're at our class. So again, homepage announcements. I'll be posting the announcements from uh, the first course. The two questions I ask and the videos that I'd like you to watch soon. By the time you see this video, they should be posted. So, excellent. If you look here under lectures and PowerPoint, for those who like to play along, here you see all the slideshows. These are all the material I'm covering. So we're going to have 15 chapters, basically. And we're going to have a couple on nonverbal. So just moving ahead, what you have to see and do. Again, remember, you can look at the videos here by going into the virtual classroom, clicking on the three dots, and of course going to recordings. So you can look at those. So all right, we'll stop sharing that. And we're going to share our unit two PowerPoint. Being difficult. Sometimes it does that. There we go. So jump in. There we are. So chapter two. We talked a lot about communication, a lot about public speaking, and there's so much more we have to cover, right? So much. But don't get discouraged. We're going to break it down bit by bit by bit. So in chapter two. Let's look at the overview. Why would we make some sort of analysis of our audience? Why would we care what our audience thinks? What are demographics? What are psychographics? And no, they're not some sort of crazy demonstration from one of our exes, right? We're going to learn about psychographics, what they are. We're going to talk about contextual factors within audience and analysis of audiences and what we can learn from the audience. Because believe it or not, we as public speakers can be learning too. And then we're going to talk about why we listen in public speaking and how we should listen. When we think about public speaking, it involves content and relationship. Always, always, always. Relationship depends on knowing your audience. And we know our audience through the analysis of demographics in psychographics. So let's talk about demographics. Demographics, demographic characteristics, what are they when we think about it? Now, the goal with demographics are not to stereotype, which is to overgeneralize about um, groups of people or members of an audience. And it's also not finding one characteristic of people in defining all of the audience by that characteristic, okay? But what we wanna do is look at certain things in demographics. What, who are we speaking to? How should we address them? So when we think about this, really? Okay, that was one of my dogs, if you heard. Sorry about that. She's yawning. She's bored by this whole concept of teaching. So when we think about this, we have positives and negatives we have to watch for, right? We want to appeal to certain things. There's our positive. If we understand our audience, we can appeal to them in positive ways. We also know what to avoid. So let's look at what are demographic characteristics. And by all means, this is not all of demographics, but these are the majority of them. In my world, Target age, target audience, right? We look at someone's age. Where are they from? 
How much education do they have? What's their income level? Because I live in a world of advertising. That's what I do. My messages go out. I work for a jewelry store. We're looking for specific people, right? We're not trying to blanket everyone with our message. We're trying to find a specific audience. So when we think about these things, we're looking for certain people, certain ages. We're not really care race or ethnicity or culture does really is not as big a deal. However, it can be a big deal because you don't want to offend people and you want to be inclusive. I hope you do. So when we think about these things, some of them we need to think about in the way of, oh man, I need to be inclusive. I need to care. I need to show that I care. These are all demographics, religion, sexual orientation, family status, common bond. Each one of you in this classroom has a common bond. You're all students. You're all in public speaking. Noise, noise in this in this lesson. Sorry about that. So again, we're going to look at these things in trying to figure out how we can better talk to an audience. For instance, if I know my audience is within an age group of twenty to thirty, I'm not going to talk about talk to them about old time telephones. It's not going to be a reference point that I use. You know, corded telephones on the wall. It's lost. They've never experienced that. They may understand it, but the reality is the reference point is lost for an age, right? If I'm speaking to people, to an audience in Paris, I'm not going to talk about the length of commercials and the fact that in America, the commercials are so, so pervasive in an hour worth of television. It would be lost on them. If I were if I were doing a speech to a specific religious group, let's say Catholic, Catholics, I'm probably not going to talk to them about charities that the Baptist church is running, right? It would make sense. I'm not going to talk to a bunch of doctors about what street sweepers experience every day. Yeah. It's about knowing your audience and what your audience might be interested in. We're using demographics to try to figure some of these things out. If I'm talking to grade schoolers, I'm certainly not going to be speaking with them like I'm speaking with you. Right? My language will change a great deal. It needs to. Now, let's talk about psychographics. And again, I told you, these are not crazy things that your ex is doing. All right? This is psychographics, meaning psychology. These are things that are more internalized. Beliefs, attitudes, values, and needs. So when we think about these things, oh my gosh, beliefs, attitudes, values, needs. Let's talk about them. Let's break them all down so we understand them. Beliefs are what we hold to be true. These are impossible, or these things are hard, but not impossible to change. They're difficult to change, but not impossible. Meaning we believe something until something shows us another way to believe. They come from our experience and they come from what we call authority. In this case, authority is what others have told us, what other books, what other people have told us. And they come from our traits of stability, centrality, saliniacy, and strength. And what I mean by that is each these things, beliefs are held to be true because we want them to be true. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to speak to the dog. It was about to start barking. Go lay down, please. So when we think about these ideas, stability, saliniacy, centrality, these we have beliefs to help make decision making easy in our lives. That's actually why we do what we do. Attitudes. Attitudes are not our mood. Don't want you to think about mood or emotion in this. Our attitudes are either positive or negative experiences or responses 
to a person, ideas, object, or policy. When I showed you that picture of Trump earlier in lesson one, he was president at the time I built that slide, so that's why I used it. Now, seeing that image probably evoked either a positive, negative, or a neutral response from you, the receiver. I utilize that church much for the same manner. It'll either give you a positive, negative, or even a neutral response. When we think about attitudes, it's not our mood or emotion, although those can affect our attitude. But the reality is these, our attitudes tend to be lasting meaning over a period of time. And attitudes have a direct link on our behavior, meaning because of our attitudes, we will or won't do certain things. If I have a bad experience at a restaurant, my attitude is negative. I probably won't return to that restaurant, right? It's just normal behavior. See how it was linked? Now, attitudes can come from many sources. The book talks about those sources. I'm not going to dive deep into it. The point is, we derive our attitudes from a variety of methods, but they do affect us. So I want you to think about an attitude that you may have. What is your attitude on people smoking in public places, restaurants, or bars? I want you to think about that, or even a live music venue. What is your attitude on people smoking in public places? My attitude is, I believe in personal rights, however, I also believe in my rights. I do not wish to die of secondhand smoke inhalation, right? I don't want carcinogens floating into my body unless I willingly ingest them. Meaning, I think there should be smoking areas established for people so that they can enjoy these things, but I don't necessarily want to have to subject myself to that all the time. That's my attitude. My values. When we think about values, values are goals we strive for and what we consider important and desirable. So as I took a break between lesson one and lesson two, as I'm recording, I went back to one of my values, which was answering my work email and responding to my family's text. That tells you two things that are important to me, my values, right? What is important? Communication to those people. These are not the same things as once, all right? They're goals we strive for, what we consider important and desirable. And they're not physical objects, meaning they're, they're ideas, they're thoughts, they're actions. In my case, mine was an action of responding via text to my wife, right? So when we think about values, what do you consider important? I consider hard work important, but I also consider family important and time for family. I consider education important, but I also consider living life important. And you have to find those balances to make those things happen. So I want you to think about your values, your values. When we think about needs, these, we all know what our needs are. We have certain needs that are Physiological, meaning food, shelter, right? Those are things that we need. And we have levels of need. It's Maslow's hierarchy, okay? When we think about life <clears throat> and we think about needs, there are deficiencies we're motivated to fill, meaning if I'm hungry right now, I need to go eat, right? If I'm tired, I want to go to sleep. When we think about needs, there are so many levels. And Maslow actually broke them down. And since I told you in the first class, one of the things I studied is psychology. I think about psychologically how things play in the world of communication. So when we think about once we met our basic needs, food, shelter, we create a form of safety. Once we have a job, we can have income. 
again, creating additional ideas of safety and even creating an area of belonging. We belong at work. We belong at school, right? It starts to happen. From there, we can start to love others and love ourselves and start to love others and care for others and do things for others, which builds our self-esteem, which allows us to self-actualize, meaning become a better human being. Now, the choice is truly ours, but we have to have each one of those levels filled in order to get better, in order to be better, in order to be the possible person we can be. Some of you may be stuck in one of these levels. Some of these may be struggling with these levels, and I totally understand that, and I get that. Throughout the course of my life, I have went from having to almost having nothing to having again. I'm prepared that that cycle might change again. I don't want it to, but I can understand and appreciate that. Needs affect our ability to communicate. Needs of the audience affects our ability to communicate. So we're gonna think about that moving forward. So when we think about what is the need of the audience? Well, time, time is a need of the audience, right? How long am I gonna sit here and listen to this? Kind of mean, but it's true. Many people think that way. So when we think about the contextual factors of public speaking, number one is always time. A, we should be respectful to our audience and know how long we need to speak for. We don't wanna be too short too brief. We don't want to be too long and too boring, right? We also have to think about what time of day the speech is given. Is the audience expected to be hungry or are they going to be falling into their afternoon nap after eating, right? These things come into play. Why is that audience gathered together there in the first place? My audience is gathered together because they are taking public speaking. I have to think about what is your physical space like? Make sure my voice is broadcasting to you. Make sure it looks interesting to you. Sorry, my backdrop isn't as amazing as it usually is. For one thing, this program will not let me use my green screen, and I hate that. But then again, I don't really have an office to use a green screen in anymore. Downsize my home, don't downsize my life in many ways. Preparing for a, st for a student to graduate and move on to college and <clears throat> changing up how we spend our money. But when we're talking about regular public speaking, we have to think about how big the space is. Do I have to project my voice to get it all the way back to the back? Do I need to use a microphone? How large is the audience? Or how small is the audience? Because smaller audiences are more intimate and we can speak to them in such ways. When we think about our audience, what is their expectation? Why are they gathered there? And why, what are they expecting to receive from you, the speaker? All those are contextual, fact, contextual factors within public speaking. We have to honor them and be respectful. It's truly about us. When we talk about public speaking, we can't get away from listening either. Most of the time, we're listeners. Most of the time. Now, your work for this class is going to be for chapter two. Your week or your chapter two question is going to be completing this website, completing some testing. It's about listening skills. I want you to go to this place and do this test. I'll have it in our announcements. But I want you to go there and I want you to do the test. I want you to check your listening skills. But before you do that, I don't want you to break away from me. I want you to stick with me. I want you to think about how you listen. So let's start with the differences between hearing and listening. And I deal with this all the time because 
There's an 18 year old in this house. Hearing is the physical process by which sound waves hit the eardrums and send a message to our brain. That's hearing. Listening is an active process where one specifically is making an effort to understand, process, and retain information. Why is listening important? Well, I give you the answer right here. When we're listening, we're learning. We're retaining information. As a student, the average, well, let's start with the first circle. The average person spends most of their day communicating, 30% of it not communicating. You are not an average person. As a college student, you spend 45% of your day listening. Actually, quite honestly, you spend more than that as a college student, or you should. You're going to spend some of your time reading, some of your time writing, and then some of your time speaking. That's just what a college student does, right? As we age, these circles change. But one constant remains in our life, and that is listening. So when we think about there are types of listening, we can practice these types of listening better in our lives, <coughs> excuse me, becoming better students, becoming better people, learning more. So let's talk about the types of listening. Comprehensive, meaning understanding and remembering important information. That's mainly what a university student is doing, right? Comprehensive, understanding and remembering important information. But then think about it. When I communicate with my friends, I'm doing this, empathetic. I'm understanding feelings and motivations with the goal of helping others. It's relationship-based, relational. Then there's appreciative listening, and I enjoy this, and I rarely get a chance to do this. I'm going to try to do this in a few minutes. I have to go get my COVID booster. I'll be meeting my wife for lunch, and in that process of driving the 14, 15 minutes to her office, I am going to, today, change from comprehensive listening, where I'm listening normally to podcasts about my industry. Instead, today, I am going to listen to some artistic pieces. I'm going to listen to some bands that I haven't heard, or two bands that I like, have, re have released new albums. And I apologize for my dog loudly drinking water. Yes, I'm glaring at you while you glare at me. So I have two dogs. I have a great Pyrenees lab mix. So she is giant. She weighs about 100 pounds. And then I have the dog that tends to be the dominant dog, which is a terrier poodle mix of 20 pounds. She is like one fifth of the size of the big dog, but yet he's the one that tends to run the house as far as the animals go. So anyway, sorry about that. I got interrupted. ADHD kicked in, didn't it? So, but the point is empathetic listening. Now you know something more about my life. Do you see how I brought that all the way full circle around? Now you have a better understanding about my family, my goals, and my motivations of helping you and being relationship-based to you. Many of you have animals, pets in your life, so you can appreciate that. You can identify with that, and it helps create a better understanding of each other. So appreciative, I'm listening to a couple bands on my way to go meet my wife for lunch, right? So that's going to be fun, going to be good. So then there's critical listening, and many of us do this very well, and we don't really need extra training in it. How many of us, and we all are probably guilty, so raise your hands when you get, when you think about this. How many of us are listening to someone speak, waiting for them to mess up? We're looking for evidence or arguments that we wish to counter with. I'm guilty. I've done it too. Especially my first degrees in journalism. I don't believe anything anyone says. I kind of believe it, but I believe that they have a personal motive in it. And so therefore I want to dig and figure out deeper. That's the journalist in me. 
Now, the, the loving human being teacher in me says, I want to believe everything everyone says, and I want to feel empathy for them. So we need to listen balanced with a balance. I want you to think about audience and listening. We as speakers can help our audience listen, and here's how. We can plan redundancy in our speech. What do I mean by redundant? Repeating ideas and phrases. It helps a speaker in their audience. It helps when we use a clear central idea statement, which we are going to talk about. It helps when we preview our main points. We must make connective statements to lead someone to the next idea. And we need to provide an overall summary within the conclusion. If we do those things, we lead our audience through our speech. It helps create redundancy, and they may remember our three main points. When we think about redundancy, redundancy is the deliberate repeating of structural aspects within a speech. Okay? And redundancy. Now, we all have barriers to listening. And one of the biggest barriers right now is the fact that we're conditioned by our electronics. We're conditioned in an environment of always being entertained, right? And it's changed the way we want to perceive the world, meaning we don't want to sit around for a long speech. I have a little podcast that I've been working on, but I don't know when I'm going to get it uploaded to YouTube. So, But I'm working on a podcast of historical bikes because I'm a big history buff. And I'm working on this podcast of historical little bite-sized 10 minutes or less segments is my goal about history around us. And my first few episodes are all about North Georgia. Things around us, things that were important, things that happened. So my goal is I realize that we don't listen like we used to, and I have to break it down into a much more enter entertainment paced format and keep it short. So what, what did I mean by neuroplasty earlier? Well, neuroplasty is the ability of a brain to form and recognize synaptic connections, meaning create learning experience and new ideas, okay? So when we think about neuroplasty, it's how our brain learns. Noisiness and electronic distractions are our biggest barrier to listening. Our phones are all constantly going off, buzzing. Other people are doing things. Oh my gosh, there's Snapchat to Joe check on. Let's go check on it, right? Oh my gosh, did you see what they posted? You know, we're distracted. We're all distracted by our electronics. So there's our first barrier to listening. The second barrier to listening is our brains process faster than speakers can talk, meaning we're bored. We get bored, and then we start to look at stimuli around us, like my dog's getting a drink of water or yawning or shaking out or running around playing ball, in my case. Your stimuli around you could be students talking or man, mom keeps coming in my room, right? It can happen. But one of our biggest barriers to listening that, and one that we can adjust, we can fix, we can correct. There's actually two I'm going to talk about. Them. The first one, I, I know we can change. The second one, I believe we can change. When we go into listening with no purpose and no preparation, how many of you show up for a classroom and then fail to take notes and then fail to pay attention? If you go into listening with no purpose and no preparation, you are doomed to fail. Okay, I'm not going to tell you you're going to fail your class, but you're going to limit the amount of knowledge you take away. In fact, you're going to limit it to one to three things out of that class. But if you take notes, if you're prepared and believe you're going to go into a classroom and going to learn, suddenly you take away three to eight things. 
repeat things. That's powerful. Much, much better learning ratio there, right? So think about it. Go into your classrooms, prepared to take notes, prepared to learn. And when I say prepared to take notes, take notes, actually write things down. Believe it or not, even typing it is okay, but writing it down is still the best. And the biggest negative for us, we as a barrier to listening is we go into ideas, we go into thoughts or places with prejudice and preconception. We may think I'm stupid, I'm not good at this, I'm not gonna be good at public speaking, but I have to take it. Check those things, get rid of them. They're not beneficial to us. Don't have prejudices. Don't believe in bias. We're all human beings. We deserve to be heard out. We deserve our messages to be heard. We deserve to love and help others. Cast away the prejudice and preconceptions. Just because somebody doesn't have on the most stylish clothes doesn't mean they're not a worthwhile person to hang out with, right? We've got to get past our ideas sometimes because they're the ones that are standing in the way of us actually experiencing life in a better, more meaningful way. So ways we can improve our listening. First of all, believe your listening matters. It does, especially as college students, it really matters a lot. Remember what I told you, if you go in without the preparation, without the thought of listening, one to three things you may take away from a class. If you go in and take notes, suddenly you go three to eight things that you're going to take away. That's pretty impressive. Come prepared. Be ready. Be purposeful. Take notes intentionally and intelligently. Do not write down every word. Again, like I told you, on paper is better than on a laptop because when we write something, our brain sees it a second time. When we see things more than one time, we tend to remember them. <clears throat> you want to know how to get better at studying? Put it in front of your brain five times. <clears throat> seven if you can. If you put it in front of your brain five to seven times, the likelihood of you forgetting it is slim to none, no matter what your intelligence level. Write your questions down and ask them later. Ask me questions. That's what email's for. And think about this. Am I listening? Am I learning for just a moment to pass this class? Or am I learning to change my life? Because if I become a better public speaker, this can change my life. I might find myself in a leadership role, getting paid twice as much as my peers are making that work under me, right? And when I say under me, I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. Um, without leaders, we fail to get the job done many times. And without workers, we definitely fail to get the job done. So when we think about this, I've got two skills tests that I want you to take. Where can we learn to improve our communication skills? If you'll take these quizzes, these will help you learn. So these will help you communicate in a much more meaningful way. And it's stuff that you can see where you're strong and where you're weak. And that way we can pay more attention to the areas we need to grow in. Does that make sense? Again, I'll put the link, I'll put the links at the end of or on the announcements page. Please make sure you do them. Email me your results, okay? I'm gonna be honest with you. Your results will go into a database, okay? With the company and with me. With me, it will always be confidential. With the company, it will always be confidential too. With skills you need, they'll keep confidence. Look at their privacy policy if you don't trust me. But I'm working on a doctorate and believe it or not, these pieces of information are huge for me because I'm writing a book on 
how teachers can be better at communicating to their students and how students listen. And if I can do that and be effective, and if people buy it and they put it into practice, it may not help your, your generation, but it'll help your kids. I'm going to show you, as a man who has three degrees in communications, uh, how I'm going to show you my results and how I'm not perfect. And I was brutally honest to myself. All right. I was brutally honest. I want you to be as well. Okay. So my overall score, my overall score was a 78, meaning I have above average personal skills, but not great. I could be better. And it, right off the bat, I'm going to hit you with my big negative. My big negative is listening. I'm average as a listener. I'm almost to above average. At 65%, I would have gotten to above average. I rated myself as an above average listener, but here's my problem. I'll tell you exactly what it is. My problem is I tend to finish other people's sentences. I tend to rush communication rather than taking the time to listen. And I'm working actively on this, okay? And through skills you need, you can work actively on this to develop better listening skills as well. So right off the bat, I show you, this is where I fail. I fail miserably. I'm working hard. I'm actually better at listening now than I was five years ago. But I took this test five years ago, and these are, these are my scores. My emotional intelligence is 91. If you haven't figured it out, I can talk to people. I can identify with people. I can empathize with people. It's a skill set that I've learned over time. Maybe I was blessed with a bit of early on, but I have continued to develop it. I really try to think about what people might feel and the words I use and choose. Now they affect others. So my verbal communication, again, 75%, I'm above average. However, one of my problems, sometimes <clears throat> I talk over people's heads, occasionally, not always, but about 10% of the time. And when I do that, I limit my ability to be a much more effective communicator. I'm working hard to avoid that and to change that. And I have changed that. If I were to take this to test today, I'd probably be more about an 85, which is good. I've improved greatly. And one of the biggest reasons I improved was because I'm teaching. I'm learning where my faults are and I'm learning how to be better at it. And that's a beautiful thing. Listening is a skill that you learn, not that you have initially. Communicating in groups, again, I do a great job there. However, I tend to steamroll in a group because I tend to become a group leader quickly, especially if, there's, if it's in a vacuum and no one else assumes a leadership role. And in doing so, I don't always effectively hear the rest of the people in my group, and therefore, it makes me weaker. And I'm getting better at that. I'm being honest. I learned some of these things over time. So that's it. I want you to do the exercises. I want you to put in the work and do the exercises. I'll, like I said, again, I'll probably, I, I will uh, put them, I definitely will put them in the announcements. And <clears throat> hopefully I'll remember to trigger the little button that says email students. And that way you'll have them in the email. So that's it for us. But a little bit of work this week. Doing some honest survey. Look at yourself. Look at yourself as a communicator and as a listener in this case. And think about how we can be better. It's going to give you pointers. And in, within that program, it can help you if you're willing to take the extra step and click into the extra lessons. It can help you be a better listener. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, you're a great class. I'm enjoying this thoroughly. I hope you are too. Give me some feedback if you are. I appreciate it. Teachers need to hear that they're doing a good job. If you, if they are, please tell their, your teachers that because sometimes teachers get discouraged. 
This is not the way I wanted to teach this course, but it is the way we have to do it, at least at this point in time. Perhaps the situation will change in the future, but right now I have to think about an 18 year old getting ready to go to college and uh, making sure we've got some more expendable income to help her while she's in school. So that's it. Thank you very much. Chapter three will be coming soon. See ya.